our symposium, The Vote, Reimagining What It Could Be. I'm Deandra Rose. I'm Director of Research for Polis, the Center for Politics here at Duke, Duke University Stanford School of Public Policy. And I'm excited, excited to welcome you to the third panel of our two-day symposium. Today, we have heard about um, how to promote voter participation among young voters. We've heard about the responsibility and the role uh, that campaigns play and the responsibilities they have when it comes to promoting democratic engagement and connecting with voters. And in this panel, we're excited to think about fresh approaches to promoting civic engagement and voter participation. We've got an all-star lineup of panelists with us today, and we're very excited um, to, to be with you for this conversation. So thank you so much for joining us. I want to start a little bit with a little bit of um, housekeeping. So um, to tell you a little about how this panel will proceed, the moderator will host discussion, guide discussion for about 35, 40 minutes. And then at that point, he will open it up to the audience for questions. So please be thinking about any questions you might have for the panelists, and we'll be really excited to pose them later in the session. And you can add those in the question and answer function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So please don't be shy, uh, enter as many questions as you like. I should also mention that uh, this is a recorded video that we might post on Twitter, I'm sorry, on YouTube. I'm mixing all the social media platforms up today. Um, and so without further ado, I will um, welcome Professor Mac McCorkle, who is leading this discussion of Fresh Perspectives, Innovative Solutions for Increasing Voter Turnout. And Professor Mac McCorkle has served as an issues consultant to political candidates, state governments, and various organizations for the last two decades. Since starting uh, McCorkle Policy Consulting in 1994, he's worked for state and federal candidates in North Carolina, as well as 28 other states. McCorkle has published a number of articles on politics and public policy in academic journals and such magazines as the Columbia Journalism Review, Commonwealth, and Society. He graduated from Princeton University magna cum laude in history and Duke University Law School with honors. And he clerked on, um, Mac, where did you clerk? I apologize, I'm missing the second stage. So Sixth Circuit of no, no consequence. <laughs> and, and I should also mention that Mag McCorkle is uh, the director of Polis Center for Politics and my partner in crime, I have to say, I'm so excited uh, that you'll be moderating this discussion, Mac, and um, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Deandra. And will, I, will people be joining me, the, the uh, panelists? Yes. So uh, we would also invite our panelists to please share your video. Uh, feel free to unmute yourselves. And we're really excited to have you here. So thank you all for being with us today. Well, well hello, everybody out there. I see our participant level keeps on increasing dramatically, which is wonderful. Um, the title today of this panel is Fresh Perspectives, Innovative Solutions for Increasing Voter Engagement. And uh, as Deandra has characterized herself, my partner in crime, Professor DeAndre Rose and I, when thinking about this panel, about the whole, all the sessions, but especially this panel, we thought we would be in the midst of a very dismal year uh, in terms of the politics, and we are uh, campaign politics, but rather than bemoan that state, we thought it was really important that we get some democracy entrepreneurs together to talk about some things going forward uh, in, in, uh, that might be help our democracy and voter engagement in the future. So we have some, we have uh, uh, five very interesting democracy entrepreneurs, two on the same team today. Uh, uh, Richard Lang and Lupton Abshire are leaders in the advisory voting effort. Uh, we have Aliyah Batier, uh, who is the CEO of Vote ER. Uh, we also have Karthik uh, Balasu Bramian from Howard University and the founder of Block Power. And Jim Henderson, who is the leader of the Ranked Choice Voting Effort in Massachusetts. Uh, rather than me go through stilted introductions of everyone, what we thought we would do is give everybody a minute or two to give them a little bit of background 
about themselves, maybe about the, the efforts that they're engaged in right now. And then I'll come back uh, with uh, about five or six minutes of questions for each panel uh, team, uh, for each effort uh, about their specific effort. Then maybe have some general exchange uh, among panelists and me, and then go to the uh, audience. So let me start with uh, Jim Henderson at, uh, from Massachusetts and the Ranked Choice Voting. Jim, introduce yourself. Today. Great. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, first of all, Mac and Deandra, for inviting me to participate in, in this uh, panel discussion. I, I am honored. Uh, so as Mac referred, I am the general counsel and treasurer of the Yes on Two campaign. You can probably tell by my uh, background here. We are working um, to enact ranked choice voting through a uh, citizens ballot initiative here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We have 27 days to go before um, our, our uh, election, and hopefully uh, some success here. Um, I am uh, by day an attorney, much like Mac, that sort of background, but I've been an advocate of ranked choice voting for almost two decades. So this has been a long effort on, on my part and uh, hopefully will end up being a fruitful one. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Karthik, could you tell us a, a, a little bit about your background and Black Power? Sure. Uh, well, um, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm actually a, a Duke alum um, and uh, oh. from the Pratt School of Engineering um, a long time ago. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm now a professor of information systems at Howard University. Um, kind of had a parallel life in politics, though. So worked for Obama 08 um, in Cleveland, Ohio, Obama 12 um, at headquarters in finance, and then uh, worked for Deborah Ross's campaign in North Carolina um, in 16, oh, okay. where I managed budget and analytics. Um, and after that campaign, it was just kind of a really glaring thing, um, realizing, hey, you know, there's a, a huge percentage of, North Carolina is 22% black, um, and, um, and, you know, our, you know, the effect, uh, Kind of the the sum total of many campaigns outreach in uh, in North Carolina and you know, further south as well um, to uh, black voters is generally a small amount a token amount on African American radio and just generally like dumping people uh, with paid ads um, and uh, essentially that was you know if you do some back of the envelope math this is like a giant waste of money um, and um, essentially where we went from there was um, was trying to figure out, okay, can we essentially find folks who know low propensity black voters and talk to them um, based on what we call relational organizing or the friend to friend outreach is kind of the best way to turn out voters um, and, um, and drive turnout that way through what we call compensated relational organizing. So essentially what we do as block power is that we pay folks up to $500 to talk to people that they already know um, on the low list of low propensity black voters. So folks who are registered, but don't consistently vote. Um, and we think Karthik, that- let's, let, let, let's go into a little bit more detail. Let me get Sorry. a yeah. panelist and, and yeah, yeah. come back. Thanks for having yeah. Me. Yeah. Aaliyah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Uh, Mac and Deandra, thank you for having us. Duke is actually one of our biggest partners at Vote ER, and so glad to continue uh, that relationship through this discussion. Uh, my name is Aliyah Batia. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Vote ER, and Vote ER is kind of a play on words. I saw on the attendee list we have some doctors in the audience. Uh, it was all about voter registration in the ER, hence Vote ER. And with the onset of COVID-19, uh, the WHO declared COVID a pandemic and the work we were originally doing <laughs> went poof. But it had never been clearer in our lifetimes that health and democracy were intricately related. And so a lot of the work we've done since then has helped make sure that we can respond to this uh, fascinating and somewhat terrifying moment at the crossroads of democracy and health. And as a result, we've helped bring together over 200 hospitals and 25,000 healthcare providers around this work. Great, thank you. Uh, now we'll go to, quickly to, to Richard and, and Lupton, the, the team on advisory voting. Richard, introduce yourself to the audience. Well, hi, uh, I'm Richard Lang, and uh, I am an entrepreneur, lifelong entrepreneur in uh, two areas primarily. The, the uh, technology area is one where I was a pioneer in the uh, consumer electronics industry, co-inventor of the first like VCR, and then 
subsequently in the second company, uh, Democrasoft, uh, we created an online collaboration and voting platform that's been used by uh, more than 75,000 educators around the world. And uh, that covers the tech side, but the other side is the democracy side. And the thing that drives me and, and uh, that brings me here today, and by the way, thank you for including uh, Lupton and I today, is that uh, I've come to realize, we've come to realize that uh, as a society, we have a, a truly historic opportunity to upgrade our democracy in a way that we really never could have imagined. And it's uh, almost too simple, but it does require a bit of a paradigm shift. And that shift has to do with recognizing that while reform within the existing system of government that we have is vital and important, we have a, a, a second way to approach revitalizing our democracy, which is by recognizing that there's an opportunity for a new type of voting. And that voting is advisory voting. Thank and, you. And let me get, let Upton pick. Lupton, let's pick up that thread and tell us a little bit about yourself, self, and then we'll get into more detail. I'm an Episcopal priest. I'm originally from Washington, D.C., and I'm currently living in northern Colorado, happily. And uh, I am uh, also a democracy entrepreneur. I'm collaborating with Richard Lang, my role in this startup, highly innovative initiative to create a new kind of voting, which we call advisory voting, is strategic outreach to help bring influential leadership around uh, this startup initiative. Thank you, Lupton. Let, let's go to Karthik. And let, Karthik, uh, you were getting going about block power, and I, I was very fascinated since I'm a former Democratic political and dealing with uh, especially the, the African-American or black vote in the South, which is the truly the base for Democratic, uh, Democratic Party voting. But as you say, a lot of the strategy has involved taking for granted, I gather, in uh, the, the black vote and then having a little radio on at the end. And you were explaining the block power is a, is a wholly different transformational concept. So pick up that thread if you would. Yeah, sure. Um, so essentially the, like the fundamental idea is like, hey, there's a ton of money that's flowing into, into ads, by and large broadcast and cable TV ads and a little bit more on digital this year. Um, but we know that that actually is, uh, that moves a needle one percentage point or less. What we, and kind of, if you zoom out and look, if you take it, you know, if you look at all 100 percentage points of uh, eligible, el eligible black voters, 40% um, uh, didn't vote in 2016. So what we're doing and what we're dumping money into moves the needle one percentage point out of those 40. Um, and that's something that, you know, like, and even, even kind of like decades of traditional, uh, traditional uh, uh, you know, voter turnout models, you know, so focused on, uh, paid canvas and paid phones and mailers, basically all the ways that you can spend money um, moves the needle at most three percentage points. Um, and part of that, so what we do know is relational voter engagement, or essentially you making a list of your family members, friends, and neighbors, and going to talk to them about voting, that has, that's kind of the gold standard um, in voter turnout. Is that based on a relationship that drives voters. But the only problem is, is that the people who are likely to volunteer for campaigns don't know the folks, like the circles of the people who um, are volunteering campaigns don't know the folks who, um, who, who uh, don't vote. Um, and essentially what, we, what, essentially what we do is we focus on finding people who know folks who don't vote and paying them to talk to folks that, who, don't, who don't vote. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yeah, that's our fundamental model. Um, so in, in, in the COVID era, uh, in, in what you're saying obviously is supported by reams now of academic research that, as you call it, relational, get out the vote, talking to people who know each other rather than doing this on a stranger, but stranger to stranger basis. How, how, how are you coping with and dealing with the COVID era when, when it's hard to have that direct in-person relational 
Really yeah, strong. yeah, yeah. So basically right now, like right about now, we should have, you know, thousands and thousands of people going out and knocking on doors. Um, we're not seeing that um, because, uh, because of COVID. So essentially, the nice thing about this is that if you already if you already know if you, if you already know folks, you already have their a way to get in touch with them. Like you already have a pre existing relationship. So whether that's um, phone number, like you having their phone number, you having their their Facebook ID to Facebook message, um, or however you get like younger folks like TikTok and Snapchat and all of these different methods of communication that are not uh, that don't require in person contact. So essentially what our platform does is it's all phone based. So it's all based on text messages. Um, so we basically have a list of um, a list of the half million or so uh, eligible black voters in North Carolina, for example. Um, and we have a platform where they go in and find the people that they know, and then they text them back and forth. We have a confirmation process and then they get paid out that way. Is North Carolina, now North Carolina's voting data public voting data is very helpful, I know, to for, for kind of characterizations. What about in the rest of the South and the rest of the nation? Is yeah. that a challenge or? Yeah, yeah, so some, so some, so basically all data, all, all states have public voting records. However, there's like a big variance in how easy they make it to get it, or how easy these states make, make it. Like North Carolina is the easiest, actually, because you can just go and download off their FTP site. And you get mm -hmm. all of their all of the voter roles and voter history, um, but in other states like Georgia, it's much more painful. And some in some cases, yeah. like, it, and it's just a total mess. And um, I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Some some like innocent, none, some not. But um, uh, but but yeah, I mean, we can get that data. In, in anyone who's dealt with voter data, though, is that like in general, it's like not in great shape. Um, because we're not investing in, 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 in updating in a more frequent basis. We have a lot of students here who, who are learning to clean data. So you, <laughs> you talked about that. Yeah. Uh, get beyond the technical a little bit. Just what's your sense out there from the, the effort in terms of what we've seen this summer regarding Black Lives Matter and all the issues are around racial inequities that, that seem to be bubbling up here. Uh, what, what's your general sense about the electorate and, and the power of that message or the lack of the power of that message? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think like we're very deliberate in, you know, we're not, we're not, we're actually not even partisan. Um, so we're not, uh, we're not pushing a, a party or a candidate. And I think that's something that is unfortunately rare. Um, and kind of, as I think you mentioned before, like Democratic Party um, specifically is, I think, um, that criticism that um, that they've taken black voters for granted, I think is totally merited. Um, and, you know, the reason for that is that essentially the Republican Party on the other side is kind of essentially decided that their strategy is to suppress the voters. So like, and, and I think that this just doesn't serve anyone well. Um, and I, I think folks having an independent voice or folks just getting into the process um, will force both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party uh, to start really paying attention because once you have once you start to see 70 or 75 percent turnout um, then that forces to people, pay to start paying, people to start paying attention um, and and that I think is a, like a really that that's the message of empowerment that I think is really overdue good let's go to an, another innovative effort with uh, dealing with doctors and and the, and the medical center a uh, yeah, explain us a little bit about Vote ER. I, I know it's, it's, it's emerged here at Duke as a major effort, but how do you merge voter registration and health care? Give us some examples of that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll take the first example. I will uh, shout out our friends at, at Duke Medicine. Uh, we created a competition between different medical schools and actually the the duke unc rival rivalry model has become uh the gold standard of how we're going to do this work across the u.s winning? in the future is duke winning uh, <laughs> they're both doing very well it's not quite over <laughs> yeah, yet though okay. uh i think two of the highest performing schools in our network are, are uh the duke unc folks um so they came up with this great idea the duke students did 
to go do voter registration at a COVID testing site. And they made a sign that said, honk if you want to register to vote. And while I realized that in a, in a typical year, the distance between health and democracy might feel quite vast, I guarantee you everybody who honked in that line saw this deeply visceral connection between those two concepts in that moment that they were sitting in that, in that drive through uh, And to back up a little bit, um, you know, our founder tells this story about a young woman who came to his ER with stomach pain. And when they looked into it, it was like, basically the, the type of condition you get from starvation. So Dr. Martin, our, our founder, asked this young lady, you know, hey, what, what's going on? Uh, the condition you seem to have doesn't seem to be a medical condition. It's more that, that you haven't been eating. And she said, well, uh, I used to work two jobs. I lost one of them. And I had to make a choice between paying for my dad's medications and paying for my own food. And I chose to pay for my dad's medications. And what that story illustrates is there was, there was no specialist that we could send her to to solve this from a medical perspective, right? There's no specialist who solves that type of stomach pain. She needed a job. She needed food security. Uh, and that's where it's clear that making sure that, that patients have voice in their healthcare system is going to change things. And, and pulling on what Karthik said, we find that the folks who show up in the, the safety net systems are um, – uh, emergency rooms, our community health centers, they are also the folks least likely to be registered to vote. They are often the young, the low income, the people of color. And so this is a unique crossroads and crossing point where healthcare providers who are, um, have a lot of feelings about how the last six months have gone can offer the opportunity for their patients to get involved and engaged. How do you handle the, the political sensitivities uh, uh, that, that, that might be involved in talking to patients about politics, or, or not politics, but voting. But how do you handle the political sensitivities there? Yeah, and, and, and you know, to be clear, like uh, Karthik's work, we are also, we're a nonpartisan 501c3 affiliated organization. Right now, we're effectively a subsidiary of Massachusetts General Hospital, so we're even more, even more C3 than probably a typical um, C3. And in, in tackling that question internally, what we made sure to do was make sure we had a really broad group of advisors. Uh, we have both Republican Secretary of State, former Republican Secretary of State, and a former Democratic Secretary of State on our advisory group, um, who we consult with often. Uh, you know, the thing that we found is that it only gets political if somebody injects their own um, you know, choose a candidate or whatnot in the discussion. And, and we have really clear guidance on how to answer that question. Uh, one of them is patient asks, you know, hey, doc, who are you voting for? We can respond very honestly, I'm voting for you and your health, and I want you to make sure to, to vote to support us and, and other health care providers. And that just kind of removes the question altogether. Or for somebody who wants to give a more practical answer, you know, we partner with the League of Women Voters. We recommend Vote 411 as an excellent tool that can be used um, to sort of research candidates. Got you. Thank you. Well, I think uh, I see a theme already developing here from Karthik and uh, uh, from our, our, the first two panelists, which is we're really not talking about candidates very much. We're really not talking about parties. We're talking about people and, and getting them empowered in the system. And I think we're going to see that in the next two presentations with, with Richard and Lupton. And then we'll go to, to Jim and back to Massachusetts with the ranked choice voting. Richard, if you would tell us a little bit of just what is advisory voting, and then Lupton, if you, you would help us explain why this is something that could really help given the polarized situation we're faced in. So Richard. Well, ad advisory voting really is a paradigm shift in how we think about voting. In the only thing we've ever known since the founding of this country is we vote on one day election day and two years apart minimally, right? Uh, but that doesn't anymore need to be the case because um, voting doesn't have to take place just on election day. It doesn't have to be legally binding and it doesn't have to be about electing people. So what that adds up to is that we now have the ability to uh, conduct advisory voting where every citizen 
can have a secure banking level security advisory voting account, which enables us to weigh in on the issues that we choose in between elections. And the benefits of this is that it doesn't have to be legally binding, but the ease with which so many of us can now show up and be counted is something we've never had before. And, um, you know, once empowered with that ability, our individual voices are enabled to be combined into a collective voice on whatever we choose. And the power of 100 million, 200 million, you know, all the eligible voters that can access the voting booth as easily as reaching into their purse or their pocket gives us a new level of collective voice. Give, me, give us an example of a particular issue that you could see being, being used in the advisory voting process. Well, uh, I mean, you know, there's the broad issues that I think we all care about, like health care, the climate crisis, you know, areas where people, uh, poll after poll shows we are actually, most of us in agreement on those issues, but uh, most of us have not been counted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? So those, those are general issues. There's other issues that are more specific. You know, they might have to do with, for instance, you know, what happens if um, at this election doesn't go smoothly, the transition. And there are choices that need to be made by our leadership in Washington, whether they be judicial, legislative. Um, our ability as a population, with, if advisory voting were in place now, would be to show up and be authenticated and be counted with our collective voice. This is what we want. And that's the the greatest uh, amount of influence that we can have on our elected officials. And I gather that unlike polling, where people are polled about their opinions, this would be a transparent, uh, transparent process that would be way more impactful and meaningful to people than just a polling question on telephone or or, uh, email. Absolutely. Transparency, trustworthiness, you know, the more the technology is actually the easy part. Uh, We have the ability now to do this. Uh, What's required is a trustworthiness in the individuals and organizations that operate this as a transparent process, uh, because uh, that's what's missing now in our in our politics. We don't trust each other. We don't trust the news, you know, and we can reestablish a spot where it's not a social network. Only two things happen. We all learn about individual issues with fact verified information, and we all are able to cast an advisory vote. And that's it. And that can be transparent, that process. And that's nonpartisan. Doesn't matter what your party is or what your political label is. As an individual, you can learn about and have an advisory vote. Gotcha. Gotcha. Lupton, are, the pick up with Richard's thought, because I, I know you have a, a lot of thoughts about this. This is something that goes straight against the heart of the what we're seeing now in the political process, which is this extreme polarization where you are Democrat mainly because you hate Republicans or you're Republican because you mainly hate Democrats. How is this going to how is this going to work in this atmosphere? Right. Well, as Richard said, it's a major paradigm shift and it transcends our current two party system. Um, As an advisory voter, uh, there is no Republican, there is no Democrat, there is no Black, there is no White, there's only citizenry. Um, That's one of the innovations of advisory voting because no data is collected, right? People aggregate at mass scale around particular issues. And this recognizes that in reality, most people have an array of views, but they get stereotyped, you know, in their partisan silos, right? I mean, you, you know, it's, it's a, I mean, you can pick many examples, but this uses the technology uh, in a way that actually transcends our current social media, which is, we're realizing is quite anti-social, right? Um, and this creates a new infrastructure for civic media, nonpartisan, nonprofit. And we believe this is a a potent way to move our democracy out of its current rut, which is basically a matter of the majority of Americans, one way or another, being alienated from the political system. And this is a way at mass scale to re-engage people, but at a new level. 
that transcends partisan politics. And I just say one other thing, having, since I've gotten involved in this, I've become a student of political science and political <laughs> theory it's that dangerous. I was never interested before, but I got bookshelves filled with, and I, I cringe when I hear the word politics reduced to partisanship. You know, politics is a, should be a good word. I mean, that should be a really important keyword in a democracy. And every time on the radio or in the news, oh, well, it's politics, I kind of shout out, no, 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 it's partisanship. It's self-serving uh, extreme partisanship. So we see advisory voting also as a way to redeem politics as well as democracy in America. Lupton, real quick, how do you and Richard envision this organizationally working? What, what kind of organization are you envisioning to producing the, the questions, producing the technology to make this work? Well, the key uh, term is public trust. Um, so even beyond being nonpartisan and um, nonprofit, um, uh, we want this to be established as a trust in service to uh, democracy in America. And that's why, and this is a startup, uh, we're at the startup stage, uh, but this is why really the next step is bringing together uh, influential integrity center leadership around this. Um, and so that's what Richard and I have been involved in uh, most recently. Um, so. Okay, good, there. thank you, thank you. All right, let's go to Jim. So we've heard about efforts to expand the, the idea of who's voting and, and the ease of doing that. And Richard and, and Lupton have now added the idea of voting not just for candidates. Jim, you're talking about a, a new way in Massachusetts, not a new way, but, but an innovative way of voting for candidates, but it's not a singular vote for just one candidate, is it? Right, or, right, exactly. So, so right, both, uh, our first two panelists talked about registering people to vote. Once you get them to the ballot booth, we actually need to get them inspired to vote for somebody. And our current first past the post system really has led to this dichotomy, Republicans versus Democrats, where people have, I mean, sometimes are worried about having to vote for the lesser of two evils um, or worried about spoiler candidates. If someone on a third party is involved, you'll waste your vote if you vote for candidate X. Ranked choice voting, solves the issues of vote splitting and, and, and wasted votes. Um, and let me tell you how it works for those of you who are not familiar with it. So instead of today, when you go in and vote for one candidate and that's all, the voter has the ability to vote for candidates and ranking them in the order of their preference, as many or as few as they want. So if there are four candidates running for a particular office, you can vote for one only and that's fine. Or you can rank the candidates. I have a first choice, but I have a second and a third choice. And the special sauce, and this is the really important part for our democracy, is that in order to win the election, the candidate actually has to earn majority support. That's 50% plus one. Now, how do you do that? Well, if you, you count the first choices and if somebody gets over 50% like they do today, they'd win like you would today. But if no candidate gets over 50%, then we go through an instant runoff process where you eliminate the candidate who came in last place. And then you look to the ballots of the people who voted for that last place candidate, and then we allocate them to the second choices. It's as if we went back to the uh, ballot booth immediately thereafter, but now with only three candidates. And you go through that process until somebody earns that 50% support. Mm -hmm. And so, because of this, you can, the voter has the freedom to vote what their true preference is. So I'll give an example. Uh, right now there's a contested um, US Senate race up in Maine. Maine is the only state so far that uses ranked choice voting on a statewide basis. Now, the, the leading Democratic candidate is Sarah Gideon. And she is the one most likely to challenge uh, Susan Collins for that race. But there is a green candidate in that race, who has been more vociferously in favor of concepts like Medicare for all and the Green New Deal. Now, under our old system, if you voted for Lisa Savage, the Green candidate, you'd essentially be taking a vote away from Sarah Gideon. 
But by using ranked choice voting, a voter has the freedom to vote for Lisa Savage if they so chose. But then if they decide that this is what was advantage to them, they could make Sarah Gideon the second choice. And so if Lisa Savage was eliminated in that instant runoff process, the voters' voice is still involved in the election. And mm -hmm. their vote will still uh, lead, I mean, whether Sarah Gideon wins or loses, the voters' voice is still part of that process. Uh, so that's the very basic. Yeah. yeah, and Maine, the problem, as I understand it, Maine moved to ranked choice voting because it, one reason, it had a, a governor who won two terms with less than 40% of the vote. That's and right. Not even close to a true majority preference in that state. Because right. Of the citizenship. Yeah, yeah in, in 2010, yeah, Paula Page was elected with 37% of the vote. Um, the second place candidate was actually the centrist independent candidate and it was and, and the democrat was the candidate who came in third and so while you can't necessarily predict what would have happened there you would have thought that in a ranked system most of the people who voted for the democrat might have gone to that independent rather than to the more right-leaning paul lepage so exactly and, right and in massachusetts you recently had a congressional democratic primary with how many candidates so there were not, this is in the fourth congressional district, the seat that was vacated by Joe Kennedy, who uh, ran for Senate up here. And we had nine candidates. The candidate who won, won with less than 23% of the vote. Uh, now, fine fellow, his name is Jake Auchincloss. He supports ranked choice voting, so we like him. But you have to then, if you look at the other results, the next four candidates in that race garnered 60% of the vote. And why would, why would you point that out, Jim? And the reason is they were the four female candidates in that race. Mm -hmm. And so it's not hard to suppose here that may, the voters for those female candidates split the vote amongst four candidates under, the, under our current first past the post system. While we can't necessarily predict what would have happened in, in a ranked election because people would have run their campaigns differently, it's not hard to imagine that there might have been a different result that would have reflected the majority of the people in that district, as opposed to just 22%. Thanks, Jim. Well, I think we've seen that in various ways, people uh, on the panel are trying to really do a deep think and, and, and deep restructuring of the notion of what a majority is and, and really trying to find true majoritarian preference in, in the United States. Deandra, do we have time to, to go back to the panel or should we go to questions? I think if it's okay with you, we've got a number of really great questions, so I'd love to raise them. Yeah. Okay, so for the, the first question is from Gia DeHart, and Gia asks, what are some best practices for engaging with and encouraging family or friends to vote? Specifically, for those who refuse to vote because they don't like either candidate. I'll, I mean, I'll chime in on that very quickly. We need more candidates in a sense, and we need to have a system that encourages more people to run for office. I mean, I was uh, fortunate enough to run for Secretary of State up here in Massachusetts 10 years ago as an independent. It was hard, I didn't win. But Massachusetts, where I live here, has one of the lowest rates of competitive races in the country. And so you're sort of stuck. I mean, if you're lucky, you're lucky if you got two candidates, let alone more than that. But our first past the post system really discourages people from running. And so uh, in order to get people excited, you need to have candidates that excite people to get out there. And that means at the end of the day, having more people be encouraged to run and ranked choice voting does that. Thanks, Jim. Karthik and, and Leo, real quick, y'all are both in, in trying to get ordinary people engaged more in the process. You wanna to speak to, to that issue. Yeah, I mean, something that 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 often works is is narrative. So this is why. Um, so so especially family and friends, you have this kind of shared relationship already, um, and that person cares about you in some way. Um, and once you establish kind of a deeper relationship with them, or kind of a, a you could have a deeper conversation with them. Hey, this is why I'm. This is why I'm voting for X. But even before that, is this is why I'm voting. Period. Um, because these issues I care about a lot and this is, you know, if, if this happens and, you know, this issue that, that I care about a lot is either going to be 
um, it's it's either going to go in a kind of a bad direction or a good direction. This is why this is why you know like it matters to me. And if you care about me, um, then you will also vote. And that's kind of that's actually our fundamental bet is that you know it's maybe we're not actually convincing them um, that of the value of the vote, but we are essentially using that social capital um, to uh, to essentially say, hey, like do this for me. Um, like this is honor the relationship with me. Um, so, and I'm asking you to vote. The social capital of friendship or family connection. Okay, okay. Uh, Ali, real quick. We've, we've got great answers already in this. I'll add a, a third from a different perspective, which is, you know, the myth here is that there's only one race on the ballot in November. Uh, my dad just voted the other day. There are a bunch of other local races in Georgia where, where he voted um, that indicate that there's a massive effect he can have on local policy by voting for those other folks. And so if, if Jim's plan fails and Karthik's plan fails, make sure your friend still votes and just leave the top one blank because, you know, th that one line might not appeal to, to him or her, right? Um, and so when we look at the social determinants of health, 80% of our health doesn't have to do with our hospital. It doesn't have to do with our clinic. It has to do with things like food, economic security, whether there's over-policing in our neighborhoods. And all those down pallet items that often happen even in odd-numbered years and happen in weird months of the year, um, those drastically impact our lives and are, are as or more important than uh, the big ticket ballots. And to piggyback right off of that, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of ironic, like those odd year elections, 10% of people vote in municipal elections. Um, and, you know, and that's something that, you know, your voice is even louder um, when there are so few people that vote. Um, and these are the races that actually affect people's lives most directly and, and daily, um, is like who the mayor is, who's the, who's the DA, who's the sheriff, all of these things that are generally odd year elected officials. And ironically, sometimes the local people are the less known. People know Donald Trump and John, J Joe Biden, but don't know people who are going to affect them very directly. John, why don't we go to another question, especially we'll let Richard and, and Lupton pick up on that next question. Yeah, so this one is for Richard and Lupton about advisory vo voting. Um, and this comes from Richard Klingman, who asks, says, um, advisory voting, if it's electronic, are there any concerns about hackers and those looking to game the system? So thinking about election security and data security here. Yeah, well, uh, clearly that would have to be a, a key concern. But I think what I'll use as a, a benchmark is our uh, banking system. You know, we all use electronic, not all of us, but, you know, a great number of us use electronic banking off of our mobile devices and phones. And there are security protocols that can be employed. And I would, I would say that one of the great advantages of an advisory voting system is that because it's not a, a broad banking network or a social network with billions of access points where troublemakers can get in, um, you're only protecting a, a single page, a single question, a single spot. It's easy to anticipate where an attack might come from. And because there's no other activity there, uh, it, it, it's, it's easier to protect, ironically. So yes, people will try. There's a lot of people who aren't going to like advisory voting for reasons you might imagine. But uh, the vast majority of we the people, I think, are going to benefit greatly. So um, another question, uh, maybe I'll, I'll target this one to uh, Lupton about advisory voting. Are you finding that representatives feel resistant to the kind of oversight that this approach might um, invoke um, or that, that this might actually diminish their independence or their influence in the political system? Well, that's a good question. We haven't really engaged uh, active politicians on this yet. Um, but it, 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 I think people who are genuinely committed to public service will see this as an opportunity because what it provides is a mandate, an accurate mandate on issues that most people care about and, and thereby it provides political will. I think that's one thing that's missing for our politicians. They don't, the reason why they don't have will is because of uh, structural special interest. Um, and the people don't have a voice. And I bet there are a lot of people, a lot of politicians who would go, oh, they would welcome 
say, for example, an advisory vote that came out, say, on climate change or the climate emergency, however it's framed as a practical problem, and you have 175 million people who say this is the issue, that would be quite liberating for, again, people who really are concerned with being public servants. It would also attract a whole new quality of candidates um, to, you know, to, to office. Thank you, Lucky. Deandra, another question from the audience. Yes, yeah, so this is for Karthik and Aliyah. What percentage of the people that you all talk to have registered? So I guess wondering about the success rates. And then also if, if people did not vote, how would you track what they, uh, why they could not vote, even if they intended to? Yeah, this is a good question. So we're, um, so we're focused specifically, we're focused on three types of people. Um, so one, people who are registered, but uh, people who are unregistered, people who are registered, but um, have never voted, and then folks who are registered voted in 08 or 12, but then never again. Um, so we're, we're a super new program. Um, funding came late as, as kind of, uh, as uh, basically anyone who's <laughs> started up a, a, a political nonprofit before. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're, um, we're ramping up right now, specifically focused on the last two groups, focus, folks who are registered, um, uh, folks who are registered never voted, and folks who have voted in 08 or 12, but then never again. Um, because the voter registration deadline in most states um, has passed. Um, so essentially now we're going, um, we'll public, so voting records are, are public. So we'll know, we'll be able to, we've, we've held out a 10% control. So um, essentially we've randomized that 10%. So we'll know kind of what the effect of our program is after, um, after the election. Um, but essentially uh, we'll know which folks, um, which specific folks we talked to, or in our parlance, like who became voting ambassadors and vote triplers um, that didn't vote. And we can go back, and, and our plan is to go back to them and re-engage re them, especially in Georgia, where there's a near certain, uh, near certain runoff, at least one, um, that will be for Senate in, in January. So we'll take another shot at, at trying to get them out to vote. Um, but in the meantime, we'll actually be able to go to them with the knowledge that they didn't vote um, and spell and kind of um, take, um, um, you know, custom tailor their message specifically with that knowledge um, that they didn't vote last time. Good. Let's go to Lee. And remember, everybody remember North Carolina red voter registration ends uh, Friday, October 9th. But, uh, uh, go ahead, Leah. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, yes, with the registration deadlines, it's fascinating. Um, I, I'll answer that question in a different way. Uh, we, before COVID became a pandemic, um, the way we engaged voters was through posters on walls and through kiosks in ER waiting rooms. And what we found was that just like with any advertisement, you know, how many people walk by an ad and say, ooh, that set of shoes, I'm going to go buy those right now. What we learned was that that passive way of engaging voters was potentially a part of the solution, but there needed to be an active component. And our levels of engagement in voter registration significantly increased when we created you know, these healthy democracy kits that let individual physicians ask their patient about registering to vote, when we started doing outbound text messaging from um, clinics, when uh, hospitals across the country united under the banner of Civic Health Month, sort of our post, not post COVID, but let's call it that, our post COVID uh, menu of work. And so, um, pulling on some of the things that Karthik has said, there is something about the relationship and the trust mm -hmm. that makes it so much easier to do this work. And we try and inject that in everything we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do we have yes. for Jim? Yep, we do. Um, two, in fact. So, Jim, uh, this next question I'll, I'll direct to you. And then for the second one, I, I'll, I'll ask Jim to start us off and then um, we'll go to the entire right. panel. So for this first one, Jim, um, given the clear benefits of rank choice, rank choice voting, why, in your assessment, has it not had greater traction in the U.S. or globally, with few exceptions, besides a few pilots and in city and local elections? And that question comes from Lalita Kaligatla. Well, fascinating question. I think it's 
I think it's really based on the evolution of the American voter. I mean, and you're right. Uh, there have been municipalities that have adopted ranked choice voting um, over the past two decades. And that's really been the sort of the golden age. But I can point to the fact that my own Cambridge, Massachusetts has been using a form of ranked choice voting for almost 80 years. And so it's not as brand new, but the point's well taken that it's been slow to be adopted. It's been tested out and it's being used at the municipal level, I think because that's a probably a safer place for a lot of voters to grab onto it. If I'm voting for mayor, I know all that. Um, when Maine enacted ranked choice voting on a statewide basis, that was a certifiably big deal four years ago. And right now there are two states that are trying to do follow in Maine's footsteps, Massachusetts and Alaska. And I feel confident that, um, that if we're successful, many more states. I mean, the analogy I'll offer here, and it's not perfect, but I look at it almost, Massachusetts had a hand in this too, it was same-sex marriage. It took a little, it took a couple states to, to get it first, and then it began to snowball a little bit more. And I, I think that analogy will uphold with ranked choice voting as people see the benefits. And also as we get tired of the duopoly, and again, I don't wanna point fingers at Republicans and Democrats, but uh, specifically, but the idea that voters are often told, here are the people you have to vote for because these other people are not viable. And it, it, it generates more apathy amongst the voters. We need to engage the electorate, engage our body politic. And by giving voters more choices and knowing that all votes will count, there are no wasted votes, we can be successful and we'll see that, see that grow. But someone has to take that first step. We're grateful to Maine. We're looking to be the, that second step. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, thank you. What's so the grand finale of a question. Yes, well, you know, Jim, I believe, started us on uh, down the road that I think this question wants to take us on. Um, so I'll, I'll start with Jim, if you have anything to add in light of this sort of, you know, additional element to the question. Sure. Um, but I think for all of the panelists as innovators, we're especially interested in, um, you know, what resistance you might get and how you grapple with it. So this question comes from Ryan Partridge and Ryan says that rank, rank choice voting and other significant electoral reforms seem to threaten the DNC and the, D and the GOP duopoly. Both parties seem incentivized to block significant electoral reforms, such as by dangling minor electoral reforms as a diversion. So how do you think we might implement significant electoral reform if most of our government representatives are disincentivized from supporting it, other than hoping to raise um, public awareness sufficiently? Well, my, my beginning answer is to let, let these public officials know how important this democracy reform is. So two years ago, we had a jaw-dropping moment when um, the Massachusetts Democratic Party made ranked choice part voting part of their party platform. And today, we have both US senators firmly behind us, most of our congressional delegation, a large chunk of our state legislature, which, if any of you know anything about Massachusetts, is overwhelmingly Democratic. And so what we've been able to do through a lot of hard work on the, on the grassroots level is convince these people who are already in government of the importance of, of supporting our lowercase d democracy. And we've convinced them that ranked choice voting is the way to do it. And so the, the question is right. How do we break the duopoly? By a lot of hard work at the grassroots. And we've managed to convince some really important people that it's important. So that's my answer. Well, I'd like to add another piece, which is that I think we need to look beyond just the reform movement. As I said at the beginning of this meeting, you know, yeah, that's vital. I'm so happy that there is ranked choice voting activity and, all, and a lot of other good reform movement. But, you know, the best way to get people engaged and to let our elected representatives know that they have to be responsive is to be able to show up somewhere at some time in some numbers that they care about. And the system that we're in is one opportunity every two years. And as soon as we get beyond that paradigm and into the in between elections, let's vote. It, then, then things start to change because then we feel the strength of our own presence in, uh, in the democracy. You know, we become literally civically engaged. 
you know, there, there's otherwise no outlet in between elections. And that's why people take to the streets. And, and yet that's why there's the level of cynicism that politicians count on to be able to keep on the road that they are on uh, without being held accountable by anyone. Yeah. Lupton, you want to add to that? Well, uh, just that as Richard, and I, I don't know if this is a shameless promotion, but this is Richard's book um, that really gives all the details published two years ago. And it's called Virtual Country Strategy for 21st Century Democracy. And basically the strategy is a bypass strategy, right? It bypasses the status quo because you don't have to change any laws to create advisory voting. What we're doing is essentially taking an innovative approach to our First Amendment rights of assembly and speech. And again, it's non-binding. And we, we believe that once a, a advisory voting is established and people become re-engaged, that will supercharge all the many very important reform efforts. But you know, the fact is uh, the tyranny of the status quo. There are, you know, people, groups who benefit, you know, the political polarization industry, you know, all that billions of dollars isn't going into the ground, you know, it's, it's an industry. Yeah. So this is a bypass strategy. That's the virtual country strategy. Bypass. Okay. Karthik and then Ali will, will, will end us up and we'll go back to Deandra. Yeah, expand the electorate. I mean, like it's the people who show up uh, make the change. So like, I mean, if you think about it, uh, in municipal elections, 10% vote, um, you can win a mayorship um, with 5% of the vote of a city. Um, and that's crazy, <laughs> you know, like, um, and I think it's just, you know, if we have a different electorate, um, if we have a different electorate, we'll have different policies. Um, and I think it really, you know, 40% of people don't show up in presidential elections, you know, 50 to 60 don't show up in midterms, and then, you know, close to 90 don't show up in, in, in municipals. When we change the electorate, when different people show up, and when specifically when more people show up, um, there's going to be more in, uh, demand for systemic change. Right. Aliyah. Yeah, two, two big things came to my mind with this question. First, in the very immediate sense, uh, what we don't want is that after November 3rd, the 25,000 healthcare providers across the country are like, oh, do I need this thing anymore? Mm -hmm. Clearly, we have a lot of work to do in a lot of different elections with a broader range of the electorate. So that's the, the literal answer to the question. I think the philosophical answer that I have here is, you know, the myth is that a party is going to save us. Uh, the myth is that, that that work is external to our own lives, our own communities. And I really think that part of the starting point of tackling, the, whether you call it the duopoly or polarization, is for us to break it down in our own homes and our own communities. And um, that's where it starts. And if we do it there, then we can have the power to take it up higher. Thank you. Well, Deandra, I think our panelists have really done a great job in not just meeting my expectations, exceeding my expectations, and inspiring me at least to think about the meaning and significance of voting in a different way in a very dreary, dismal time. So they, they deserve a lot of credit, it seems to me. Do you want to end it? Before yes, us? yes, I will. Actually, I don't want this conversation to end. I, I just want to mention that um, for all of our attendees, you can check out the chat and you can see a link of where to find Richard's book, as well as a link for a great video on advisory voting um, that they shared. And if you stay tuned as after we adjourn, I'm going to share that video with everybody. So we hope you'll stick around. It's about a minute or so long. Um, but before I share my screen and show the video, I just want to echo Max thanks to this wonderful group of innovators. Thank you for the work you're doing uh, to promote democracy. Thank you for taking time to join our intellectual community and to share your insights. So it's been such a pleasure to learn from you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Okay, everybody, stay tuned. Video coming now.
us could show up in one place at the same time to be heard, to be counted. What if we could speak with one voice, 240 million strong, on any issue? Not just on election day, but every day of the year, online. Imagine a secure advisory voting booth in every pocket or purse. No political parties, no data collection, no voter suppression, no gerrymandering, no new laws to pass, no politicians to convince. Just we the people speaking with one unified voice. Impossible to ignore because we're all showing up to be counted. This is our time to take our democracy to the next level. It is our birthright and our responsibility. Our future depends upon it. AdvisoryVote.us Your vote, our voice. All right, everybody. Well, just to say thank you very much again, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Hope you'll join us same place for the next panel that starts at three o'clock. We're hearing from our amazing students in the Heart Leadership Program who are sharing work from these very impressive research projects that they've been working on. They're doing great democracy work, and we hope you'll join us here at three o'clock from three to four for Heart, Heart uh, Leadership Program student presentation. So thank you very much, and we'll see you soon.